All right, hello everybody. Uh, today we're looking at these page numbers, and if you do not have the fifth edition of Phoner, just go by these subject headings, and uh, be sure you stop before you get to an empire of freedom. So we're going to be first talking about the Middle Passage, which is the largest example of involuntary human migration in human history. Between 10 and 15 million enslaved people made the journey between Africa and the New World. It was also called the Middle Passage because it was the middle leg of the triangular trade network between the Americas, Africa, and Europe. And it's also well known because of how dehumanizing this experience was. So enslaved people that were on these ships in the Middle Passage were subject to tight and cramped conditions in the cargo hold. Rarely did they ever see the light of day. One of the most famous enslaved people who wrote a biography later in life, Olauda Equiano, wrote about how Essentially, he had less than a coffin-sized amount of space when he made this journey. Um, so, as I was saying before, they were in the cargo hold, and the reason why that was was because slaves were seen as cargo, not people, by anyone uh, that was profiting from the slave trade. And slave traders, again, they wanted to maximize their profit, so they put as many enslaved people as possible on these ships. And that did have very negative repercussions. Uh, many of them died before they reached their destination. There are even instances where the crew of slave ships would toss sickly and dying people into the sea so they could then file and claim an insurance benefit on them. They basically figured they would die anyway and wanted to make money off of them. And if you're interested in that story, you should check out the Zong, which was a slave ship that I learned about when I was in grad school. So at first, more enslaved people were transported to Brazil or the West Indies, particularly to sugar plantations where there was a large demand for labor and the harsh conditions vastly lowered life expectancy. So sadly, it was seen as cheaper for plantation owners to work their slaves to death and then replace them. And even though fewer enslaved people uh, arrived in the North America via the Middle Passage, still the population growth of slaves in North America was pretty dramatic, and this was due to natural increase. So by 1770, on the eve of the Revolutionary War, the population of people of African descent was about one-fifth of the total population of the Americas, which was 2.3 million people at that time. Um, and the other thing that's important about the Middle Passage was the effect it had on African society. So in short, the decimation of the population of West African societies meant that there was less organized leadership, there was a vast gender imbalance, and also there was war, more warring between states. And their weakened state, according to many historians, lasted for centuries. In fact, historians argue that the negative ramifications of the transatlantic slave trade made these nations more vulnerable to imperialism during the scramble for Africa. So let's look at slavery in the South. We'll look at both the Chesapeake and Georgia and South Carolina here. Um, so first, let's talk generally. So the plantation-based economy in the South led to a pretty drastic degree of socioeconomic inequality. And this includes inequality between whites, not only inequality of whites versus blacks. So at the top of the social hierarchy, you had planters, also known as plantation owners, because they owned so many slaves, they didn't actually do any of the planting themselves. They were the wealthiest in society. They owned massive plantations that were granted to them by proprietors or governors. And uh, they often owned at least 20 slaves, but in some cases on some of the very large plantations, they owned hundreds. So um, only about 0.1% of the white population in this hierarchy owned more than 100 slaves. Um, about 7-ish percent of the white population had fairly large plantations. They owned up to 100 slaves, but there were still a decent degree of small farmers. Um, that was more like 15 to 20 percent of the population, and they would own less than 10 slaves. But then the remaining 75 and change percent of the white population did not own any slaves, and many of them were actually very poor and didn't own any land. It's also important, this hierarchy, sorry, I was too lazy to make my own, and what this one sorely lacks is free blacks. I noticed that after I pasted it and started this recording. So it's important for us to realize that in this hierarchy, there was also a free black population, 
It was only about 4% of the settler population. And even though they were free, meaning they were not enslaved, they still were subject to different sets of laws that restricted their freedom of movement, their right to vote and bear arms, among other things. Um, so, uh, and then at the bottom of this social hierarchy, quote unquote, I only say the bottom because that's sort of the way it was categorized by the wealthy elite were slaves, right? And it's important, I mean, how many there are, right? By the time you get to 1770, over half of the population of the South was enslaved persons. So that's really significant. Now let's zero in on region. So Virginia um, was more tobacco-based at first. Eventually, we're going to talk about how the introduction of cotton uh, evolves slavery in the Americas, but we're going to talk about that after we talk about the American Revolution. So there was a large plantation-based system in Virginia and lots of socioeconomic inequality and an ingrained hierarchy, which we already talked about in general. Um, the success of tobacco plantation caused slavery to expand within the Chesapeake colonies, but again, there was a lot of inequality. The wealthiest planters were given the most fertile land and they were given larger plots of land and larger plantations often expanded around bodies of water to facilitate trade. Uh, and talking about slavery in the deep south, let's first zero in on South Carolina. It had a different climate than Virginia. It was much more humid. It was flat. It was swampy which was much more conducive to the rice cultivation, which had already been very successful in the West Indies and Brazil. They also started cultivating indigo, which is used to make a bluish dye, uh, like for blue jeans. And both rice and indigo required large scale cultivation, which resulted in the creation of giant plantations similar to Virginia, but actually rice and indigo plantations tended to be even bigger um, it also created much more dangerous working conditions for enslaved persons, and that was partially due to the environment. The swamp-like conditions that are required to cultivate rice meant that it was much more prone to mosquitoes that carried malaria. Another thing that makes the slave system in South Carolina stand out from that of the Chesapeake is that this thing called the task system was more common. Um, so it was essentially a system where an enslaved person was given a task or a set of tasks to complete for the day. And if they completed them early, they did potentially have a little bit of time for leisure or time to do their own separate work. They could use that time to cultivate their own crops. And also some decided to actually use the extra time if they completed a task early to do paid labor. If they live close enough to a town or city, they may be able to get a small job where they could actually make some money. And some were fortunate enough to make enough money to buy their freedom. But again, that was rare. Um, another thing about large plantation slavery in South Carolina was, again, we talked about this in Virginia, was that eventually slaves vastly outnumbered white people on the eve of the Revolutionary War. And you can see some of these figures on this map here. Last, we should talk about Georgia because it started out as pretty unique. So Georgia at first was established as a buffer zone between South Carolina and Spanish Florida. And it first was a proprietary colony, which meant that the king doled out land to his friends, the proprietors, and they were able to control the development of the colony. Um, one of the first proprietors and the founder of Georgia, James Oglethorpe, did not want Georgia to be a slave colony. But as the colony grew, new, new settlers who, who basically wanted to have full English property rights argued that slavery was property, property that they wanted to have and bring to Georgia with them. And they also didn't want plantations to be limited to a smaller size. And so they tried to advocate for the right to introduce slavery into Georgia. And by 1751, Georgia went from a proprietary colony to a royal colony and then the colonists established a representative assembly, and after that, the assembly allowed slavery. So Georgia was sort of an experiment uh, uh, as a colony with no slavery, but that experiment didn't last very long. I'm going to transition into a new video to close this out, so stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching.